correlation now between the attitude formerly held by the left on the middle of America sitting around watching a football game with a, with a can of beer, and now you have the situation where the left sitting around listening to a popular rock group with earphones on or just completely blasting out their eardrums while they're smoking goat, you know, smoking grass or dropping acid. And that there's the same situation going on there. And they don't seem to realize, unfortunately, that this is the way middle America has been controlled for years by satiating their desires and their aggressiveness and controlling their activity to a point whereas they're given something they like, okay, booze or entertainment or heavy rock and, uh, you know, grass to smoke. Yeah, and that'll keep them happy. That's, exactly. That's- All right, so that was taken from a 1972 interview between May Brussels and Preston Guillory. Guillory was a member of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office, and here he's breaking down uh, the way society controls American citizens, particularly the middle class. And the point that he's making is that while your typical middle class people will be more or less satiated by drinking a beer and watching sports when they get home from work. Uh, the way that so that they found to satiate people on the left was do the same thing, but substituting rock music and weed and LSD in lieu of alcohol and sports. Now, as I was listening back to this interview, I found that really interesting, particularly as I'm a guy who both enjoys kicking back, watching sports and drinking and has also done a fair bit of listening to heavy rock music while blasted out of my mind on drugs. I felt like both of those applied to me to a sense, particularly in my twenties and early thirties when I wasn't as dialed in, I guess you'd say as I am today. But to me, I think this is something that I notice more and more with people everywhere is that it seems like things are only getting worse in this regard the society nowadays is getting so problematic for so many people that we all tend to escape in order to get away from the, the stress that life causes us. And to me, you know, I'm, I'm just as guilty of it as anybody. Like I'll come home from work and the first thing I want to do is just like sit down in front of the screen, drink a glass of wine, watch a movie and forget about life. But what if that's more than just escapism or entertainment? You know, what if that actually is a method of social control? What if it is baked in, in other words? Is the reason more Americans aren't getting out there and fighting for their rights because they're too busy watching television or getting drunk or just finding other ways to divert themselves? You know, I'll, I'll quote Pascal Robert here because he has a really funny saying about this. He says, more people these days are interested in real housewives than real politique. And I, I have to agree with him there. You know, as we're looking into the future. I was listening to a report today on artificial intelligence and where it's all headed. And it got me thinking about the metaverse. And, you know, when I first heard about what Zuckerberg was doing with meta, I said to myself, this is stupid. Nobody's going to be interested in this. It's, you know, it's just a ridiculous diversion. But the more I think about it, I really think Facebook, well, I guess they're meta now. Meta has the right approach because what they're doing is basically the last available option. In other words, social is overrun with different companies right now. TikTok in particular is just completely eaten Facebook's lunch. And Facebook is a company that doesn't manufacture hardware the way Apple does, so they can't just fall back on marketing iPads or computers or phones or whatever. They need something new. And virtual, you know, what we used to call virtual reality back in the 90s is it. The metaverse is a fascinating concept because essentially it, it doesn't take much to envision a time, maybe it's five or 10 years from now when everybody's walking around wearing Google glasses and is just lost in their own universe. So let's examine that concept for a moment. You wake up, you get out of bed, you put on your Google glasses, all of a sudden you're in a completely different world. You are interacting with people that you only know through the metaverse. And, you know, apart from maybe driving to work 
or something where you actively have to be aware of what's going around you for your own safety, you could basically be lost in this alternate reality all day long. Oh God, this is, this is where it gets really complex because I'm operating under the assumption that you're going to go into the office. But I think once it gets to that point, we're not going to see a lot of people working in offices because I'm thinking about the implications of chat GPT right now. And I could already see that putting most journalists out of work in a couple of years. It's going to be putting out of work people that work at phone banks. It's probably going to get rid of a lot of uh, quality assurance jobs, tech support jobs. I mean, the, you think about the implications of chat GPT and everything out there that it can basically replace once it gets a little bit more refined, there's not going to be a, a lot of need for humans to be working low level service jobs. Not when the AI gets dialed into that fact. So what's that going to lead to massive unemployment? So there's two ways we can go. Either we're looking at like mass starvation and the tanking of the economy or the alternate path, which is that everybody is just provided some kind of UBI and subsists in a meager, you know, we'll say a, a small one bedroom or a studio apartment, some kind of hovel and basically is just drinking slurm all day and sitting around with their Google glasses on. And the only time that they ever check out is to get their groceries delivered to them. And by groceries, I mean, it's going to be soylent or, or something along those lines. I doubt we're going to be eating natural, healthy food at that point because it's going to be too expensive for the, the low level of UBI that people are receiving. And they're just going to be sitting in their own world 24 hours a day. And the thing of it is, maybe this will be great. I was listening to a podcast about this the other day, and they're essentially saying that you could take the face of anybody that you want and apply it to anybody that you meet in the metaverse. So say you're desperately in love with somebody, you know, and it's un unrequited love and they're all you can think about. And <clears throat> I'm sure most of us have been there. Like there's always that one special person in, that's in your heart that you just can't forget about. And maybe in the real world, he or she wants nothing to do with you. But if you're able to graft that person onto a meta character, all of a sudden you can have a relationship with them and you're going to want to be in that world so you can be with them all day long. And it's not just that maybe you'll have more status in the metaverse than you ever had in real life. You know, maybe you can become some kind of celebrity when in the real world, you're an unemployed 35 year old living in his mom's basement. And I can see the appeal to a lot of people. You know, I was even thinking about chatbots nowadays, and this is already a thing. They have chatbots that can take the place of a real world boyfriend or girlfriend that texts you throughout the day. And with the, the rapid involvement of AI, these, these bots are becoming more and more realistic to the point where if, if you're willing to kind of lose yourself from reality, you can carry on a relationship with a robot. I mean, it's really not that different from those guys in Japan that marry their pillows. <laughs> so what are we looking at here? I mean, have we reached the singularity? You know, we all saw the matrix. And I think the reason that movie resonated for so many people is because when it came out in the mid 1990s, society itself was grappling with these questions. Like we weren't quite there yet, but anyone who was paying attention to what was going on would know what the future had in store. And in philosophy circles around that time, like, the, the, you know, the questions being asked all had to revolve around like, when are we going to reach the singularity? Are we living in a simulation? Does life exist in, in the actual sense or is it just a big put on? And I mean, these are, these are things philosophers have actually been grappling with since the dawn of philosophy. You know, what is reality? Does reality exist outside of what I see with my two eyes or is everything just, you know, is it just a, a gigantic simulation? But now we're taking that one step further because now we are going to actively choose to be part of the simulation. Okay. Let's try to scale that and see where that gets us. Well, for one thing, the people that are controlling us in this scenario, 
they're still going to need essential service workers. There's still going to have to be people to build the roads, run the power grid. I'm debating whether or not we're actually going to need education beyond maybe primary school, because at that point, what do you really need to go to college for? If you're just going to be sitting in your house all day long, it really, it, it strikes me like almost something out of a Robert Heinlein novel where everybody's just sitting indoors all day long. They get their food delivered to them. They're jerking off to their Google glasses all day long. And that's a satisfactory life for people. But think of the implications. You know, the planet is pretty much going to come to a standstill. And the only people that are going to be engaged in reality are going to be the people at the top who are benefiting from all this. And, you know, the, they're, professional managerial class, I guess you'd call them, but this would not be the same as the professional managerial class of today because it's not going to be journalists and, you know, news reporters and people of that ilk. These are going to be medical workers, uh, construction workers, maybe even like sanitation workers, the people without whom society cannot survive. But I think it'll be a good deal for the people in charge because they're really not going to have to do much other than just keep pumping out more and more Google glasses or whatever the device will be to keep the rest of us occupied. And if you and I and everybody else is happy living in the metaverse, then I mean, is postmodernism just completely taken over by that point? Have we hit the singularity that Ray Kurzweil predicted where machines eventually just start teaching themselves and Will that benefit society? I mean, I've often thought as fallible as our human politicians are, maybe exactly what we need is just a giant network of computers to run our government for us. I mean, could it be any worse? The other thing I think about too is that, you know, I was talking about the Matrix earlier. I wasn't a huge fan of either of the sequels, but I thought that the Animatrix was actually really great, um, particularly that first part where they talk about the Battle of the Robots. I mean, it, it's basically just machine learning gone crazy, which, which from what I'm hearing right now is exactly what's happening. Like it's, we are at a tipping point. So the question I pose to you, is it better that we just completely zone out at this point and just give in to our cyber overlords and say, fuck it? Or is there something tangible about reality that's worth fighting for? Is it better to exist authentically or give in to postmodernism? Then Blasey went on to say, hippies don't exist anymore and the hippie movement has degenerated. But the degeneration came from the top, not the bottom. When the kids began preaching new values, the government tried to beat their ideas out of them. Now, Polanski is saying that the government is trying to change our value system. That's another excellent point there. And that's May quoting from Roman Polanski's December 1971 interview with Playboy magazine, where Polanski is essentially saying that the government is working from the top down to destroy so-called hippie values. So the question I have to ask is, was the government successful? I mean, 1971 was over 50 years ago. And we don't really hear a lot about hippies today, or I guess the hippie subculture that exists kind of has the trappings of the 1960s, early 70s hippie culture, but without the political element to it. And what I'm wondering is, is that just a matter of propaganda, or did this push take the form of immersive video games and the internet? Because again, it's difficult to really invest yourself into politics if you spend the majority of your day playing video games. And that's what I don't understand. I do sometimes feel as though my generation, Generation X, was really the last one to question corporate authority. Growing up, corporations were clearly viewed as the enemy by most of us, and I think most of the art at the time reflected that. But starting with the millennials and uh, even more so with the zoomers I'm starting to notice this kind of almost unflinching brand loyalty that I find very suspect. It's almost as though 
corporate control within society has just kind of overtaken their minds to the point where it's just unquestionable. You know, it's not a matter of if you're going to let a brand determine your personality, but more so which brand is going to. That's something I have to put a little bit more thought into. I may not be giving millennials and Zoomers enough credit here because I think there's there are plenty of them that are, are pretty awake and pretty aware of what's going on. But at the same time, I, I do notice a change in young people and children today. They seem to be not quite as independent as they were when I was growing up. And I think a lot of that just has to do with the hold that technology has on them. <clears throat> you know, we hear about parents giving tablets to their kids when they're two or three years old. And, you know, while on one hand, it's great that these kids are immersing themselves in technology and learning how to operate it and that they're not going to be afraid of how to use computers and how to use digital devices. On the other hand, it, it does seem to be causing a peculiar form of social isolation within them. And that's that's something to keep an eye on for sure. You know, it comes down to, again, how can you start a people's movement when people are isolating themselves within their own homes, playing video games all day long, or just shouting at each other back and forth on the internet? You know, I I really don't see how you can motivate large groups of people to come together like that. And again, to me, it seems like it's by design. It it appears that what the government is trying to do is to convince people the value system, what they're trying to set up the value system is that they want to convince people that uh, Nirvana is people living in the suburbs and a split level with a lot of electric appliances with plastic cases, which are warm to touch and a two chair faced kids and a pretty wife and a large dog that, you know, yeah, barks, barks when you come home. This, this is the myth. And this, this whole myth means you go out and you buy this house, you buy the products that go inside to make this house work. You buy, you buy, you buy, you consume. You you, you must consume products. And if you don't consume, uh, then Rand does a study about how to take care of you. Right. They'll, they'll decide how you're going to consume. Yeah. You must consume to keep this glorious society of ours going. You know, if you don't buy a new toaster every three years and a new car every three and a half, society as we know it will come to a standstill. You go to France, you go anywhere in Europe, you see a, you know, the average cars. 10 to 15 years old is my experience when I was in France and people there, they make use of things they buy. They don't buy things to consume them. We buy things here. Everything is a consumable. Uh, we must consume everything we use. And that includes people. Yeah. We are very busy consuming people that help make our society go. That is, for instance, if you were to eliminate poverty and uh, illiteracy in the United States, you just knocked two uh, very important political issues right in the you know in a cocktail. You can't eliminate things in the United States that politicians need to get elected on. What would man use for his platform if there was no poverty, if there was no racism, if there was no materialism, if there was no war? All of these things help get people reelected each year. Yeah, there we go. That's another great point there. And I actually see uh, that kind of 1960s consumerism getting skewered in some of the movies from back then. I was hoping to do a review of a few John Cassavetes films that I've watched recently, uh, which includes Faces, uh, his movie from 1968, which deals with this exact sort of thing in terms of just mindless consumerism and ennui in the stereotypical upper-middle-class suburban lifestyle of the time. Another very good movie is Frank Perry's The Swimmer uh, with Burt Lancaster, which deals with these kind of things. And I'd even throw in uh, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention's absolutely free album from 1967. They do a great job of skewering middle-class consumerism. So this was obviously something that was on people's minds in the late 60s, early 70s. They were already aware that America was a consumer culture. Now, today, while we still consume probably more than any, well, certainly more than any other nation on earth. I mean, we are the the world's consumer. There at least is a push towards renewable products and, uh, you know, green energy. Um, so we're making a little bit of progress, but the question of course is, is it enough? Uh, the answer probably not. Uh, I just heard the latest report from the UN that we're due to achieve a, a 1.5 Celsius overall increase in temperature 
uh, sooner than anticipated. And of course, they say once we've hit that magic 1.5 degree marks, that it's going to be catastrophic for the environment. You know, we're going to see more natural disasters, um, more awful weather events, more pandemics, you know, you name it. So the question becomes, you know, what can we do to slow the spread of consumerism when capital's engine revolves based on the consumer always wanting more and quarterly stock prices always increasing? You know, it does seem to be a feature and not a bug of capitalism that the entire system of government revolves around this never-ending consumption and in order to power it you know we need to exploit the third world and other countries and just have them be the the gasoline to to keep with the car metaphor you know this is something that even when they were laying the groundwork for the industrial revolution there must have been some people that knew that it was only a matter of time before the entire Ferris wheel came crashing down. You know, there was a lot of talk back in the 2000s about, oh, you know, we've hit peak oil. What does that even mean? I don't know. It seems to me that there's always new oil reserves being drilled, but, you know, at some point we're we're simply going to run out of resources. And even though we haven't reached that point yet, uh, the damage we've done to the rest of the world in order to keep America rolling has really been incalculable. What would they do about this new class of hippie to come down? I mean, you'll see more of it in the news media. They, it's like they need poverty. They need this young, young group. They need the drug thing to arrest them if they become too aware now of, of the kind of things we're talking about. They'll come in and bust them, you know, and and ruin their lives, you know, and get their jobs fired and everything. They needed this group of young people to come down on as they became more intelligent and aware. Yeah, 100%. You know, anybody who's ever dealt with a drug arrest, even over a small amount of marijuana, will tell you how incredibly difficult it makes finding a job, getting a college loan, or really doing a lot of different things in society. Even today when you see marijuana being legalized in certain states, there's still others out there like Texas where, you know, getting busted with just a small amount of weed will really negatively impact you. I uh, just wanted to share this real quick. This is uh, a quote from Richard Nixon's aide, John Ehrlichman. Uh, this is what he said in an interview with Harper's Magazine. Quote, the Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin, and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt these communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. John Ehrlichman. It's the only way the Youngers and the Mitchells in the United States can justify their existence. First, if you don't have any poverty, you will have a minimal yeah. amount of crime. And with a minimal amount of crime, uh, people such as the Younger can't justify their existence. Police departments will not be able to justify large expenditures for electronic surveillance gear. And the big thing right now is every police department wants its own computer. Yeah. So Berkeley, yeah, just, okay. Berkeley just got theirs over the objections, I think, of the city council. Uh my friends, they're not, they're putting a lot more into these computers and just information on who's wanted for traffic warrants. Yep. And there you have it once more proof that as early as 1972, local police departments were already procuring computers to keep tabs on citizens. And I mean, it almost sounds kind of quaint that a police department would be begging the state to provide them with funds for a single computer, considering the massive NSA data centers that we have throughout this country and throughout the world, keeping records of every single piece of information that's ever been on the internet. And, you know, as we all know, in the wake of the Edward Snowden revelations that the U S government does not require any kind of legal action or subpoena in order to track what people are doing online. So just another thing to keep in mind. I don't know what we can do about it, really. Um, the information's already out there. 
it seems to me that it's largely being held on to to use to blackmail certain people who get a little uppity or out of line. But the consensus amongst Americans nowadays a lot of the time seems to be, well, I'm not doing anything. I don't care if they spy on me or not. Well, people get the government they deserve, I suppose. At any rate, I hope you've enjoyed uh, listening back to this interview. I'll post the link to the complete one in the comments. And uh, thanks for listening. See ya.